ahead. Sure. Our mission, Helping Parents Heal, is a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting bereaved parents to become shining light parents by providing support and resources to aid in the healing process. We go a step beyond other groups by allowing the open discussion of spiritual experiences and evidence for the afterlife in a non-dogmatic way. Affiliate groups welcome everyone, regardless of religious or non-religious background, and allow for open dialogue. Attendance today at this meeting is voluntary, and we are here for the benefit of learning from and sharing with other parents whose child has passed away. It is understood that our discussions are intended to be confidential and not designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. However, these Zoom meetings are helpful to parents all around the world, and they are posted on YouTube so that affiliate members who are not, not able to attend live can also watch. Helping Parents Heal offers a wide variety of speakers to allow parents to be informed about many possible ways to heal, to connect with their children, and to learn about the afterlife. The views expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect those of Helping Parents Heal, and we, may, and we ask that you take from their presentations whatever may benefit you personally. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Mark. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, sure welcome, Mark. We're so happy to have you here. And I'm going to just introduce Mark a little bit. Mark is our co-founder. He wrote an incredible book that was one of the first that I read on this journey called Soul Shift, Finding Where the Dead Go. It's about his son, Brandon, who just happened to pass on the McDowell Mountain Range. Uh, Morgan also passed uh, in uh, at the base camp of Mount Everest. So I feel an affinity to him because of that. Uh, for, for nearly six years, Mark has been testing mediums under double blind conditions. In this process, only mediums capable of providing accurate information that is statistically significant and meaningful to the sitter have been certified. During this talk, Mark will review the testing process and explain how you should approach participating in a reading as a sitter. Um, businessman Mark Ireland's father was Richard Ireland, a deeply spiritual minister and renowned psychic and medium who counted Mae West among his famous clients. While he loved his father, Mark followed a much more conventional path in the pursuit of, a main, of mainstream success until the wrenching death of his youngest son, Brandon. This unexpected tragedy plunged Mark into the spiritual world of psychics and mediums in a frantic attempt to communicate with the dead. His defenses and pragmatic mindset began to fade as he remembers premonitions on the day of his son's death. He consults a number of well-known mediums and is struck by the remarkably accurate information their readings provide. Mark first meets with Alison Dubois, the subject of NBC's hit show Medium, and later participates in a single blind uh, lab experiment with medium Lori Campbell, filmed for a Discovery Channel feature. He then enters a new dimension of personal paranormal experience as his own physical awareness begins to unfold. This dramatic story of a father's unbearable loss and his discovery of life after death offers hope to the bereaved and compelling evidence that death may not be the end. Um, his website is www.markirelandauthor.com. So I'll type that in the chat box. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mark Ireland. Well, thanks, Elizabeth. You gotta love how publishers write these dramatic uh, pieces to go on the back of your book, you know, and that's, <laughs> it sounds like I gave you an old bio with uh, several of those things put together. So I do have a short one, I'll get you for next time. It's but, fine. Uh, it's fine. <laughs> but the uh, you know the last time I was on, we, I really did get into the medium certification program. So I'm not going to talk too much about that today. But I can dabble on if people have questions about that later on. Um, I was just going to go back a little bit more about my story and show a video. I think it's one of these things where a picture is worth a thousand words, as they say. Um, and this video now, some of you have heard me talk at the 2018 conference have already seen this or may have seen this, although we had some technical issues during 
uh, the playing of the video. So if you missed part of it, you, you can get it now, or if, if you've already seen it, you could just, you know, maybe ignore that part, or maybe you want to see it again because it's been a while. Um, but the bottom line is, I mean, uh, Elizabeth really gave a little bit about my background there. I was raised by a very unusual father. He had, he was a, he was very psychic. Uh, he also had mediumistic capabilities. Um, but in addition to, he had his own church, which was an interdenominational or non-denominational church um, that was uh, very embracing of people from all backgrounds, kind of like helping parents heal. Um, but he also was an entertainer because he took his gift and he presented it on TV shows and in nightclubs and all kinds of settings like that. And I think it was really a function of that era that he was in. Really, it was very difficult for him to show or demonstrate the abilities he had um, unless he positioned it that way, at least in terms of mainstream audiences, because it wasn't taken as seriously as it is today. There were some labs around that did some tests like Duke University. Uh, J.B. Ryan had a, a lab there where some testing was done. But on the whole, society kind of wasn't ready to go down that path. And so most of his demonstrations were more psychic in nature. Um, but he would occasionally break into some, you know, messages from spirit during those. And especially in this church, that was really the focal point. It was uh, to show the gifts of the spirit and demonstrate that life goes on. Uh, and we're basically souls having a physical experience for a while while we're here. So growing up with a father like that and seeing how he kind of knew everything that was going on all the time and you couldn't pull anything over on him. And you also saw evidence of meaningful messages given to other people you didn't know and he didn't know uh, that were highly specific and meaningful, especially when they touched on people who had passed. I learned from an early age that there's more to this than meets the eye. And I had a confidence in life after death. So I didn't really have, I think a lot of the fears that people uh, grow up with in this society that we live in, that's so materialistic and so focused on the physical nature of, of the world and the universe. And that was a big help to me because um, even though I didn't become like my dad necessarily, I, I did have some psychic things happen along the way, but I never wanted to be like the next version of Richard Ireland. It really wasn't what I was about. I think we all want to venture into our own path as we grow up. And so, you know, I got married at a young age, got a degree, got into the business world and had two sons. Um, and my youngest son, Brandon, passed unexpectedly back in 2004, and that really did spring me forward into exploring all of these issues um, on my own terms, really. You know, I'd already grown up with a dad who had this stuff, and I saw it, but I wanted to know more. I wanted to dig deeper, and it was interesting because I had remembered a lot of things my father said that I didn't really digest fully at the time, and things, his writings that were left behind, and I read them with kind of a new perspective that really helped me as I moved along and in the course of it, met some of the top mediums around the world and also some of the researchers that, that look into this stuff. So I think right now, this is probably a really good time for me to go ahead and start up this video. Hopefully not too many of you have already seen this. I hate for it to be redundant, but we'll, we'll give this a go. And then um, after we're done, I'll talk a little more and answer any questions that you may have, okay? So hang tight here. Let me see if I can get this thing fired up. The beginning of it's a little noisy, so bear with me. This was done by some students at the Arizona State University Cronkite School of Journalism, and they won an award for it, actually. Um, and it was great for me to have this as a tool to tell my story, or at least the initial part of my story. There's a lot more to it since this was done. But um, the beginning's um, a little bit noisy, so I'm just letting you know, don't give up. Here we go. very focused on my career and advancing my career and probably put too much emphasis on that. If I had it to do over again, I probably would spend more time with the family. Thank you. 
The younger of my two sons, Brandon, was born on September 30th, 1985. Brandon was just a really good-natured young little kid, uh, very friendly, uh, very outgoing to embrace other children, and really never judged anybody. As he got older, those attributes stuck with him. When Brandon turned 12, he started taking bass lessons. His brother, Stephen, had taken guitar lessons, so he just felt like he wanted to have his own instrument. And he was very dedicated to it. He had a lot of natural aptitude for playing the instrument. He got really, really good at it. In addition to that, he, he liked the outdoors. He liked to hike in the mountains and the desert. December 2003, I'd started a new job and was traveling throughout the state of California with my boss for a week. I came home on a Friday night, drove home. And as soon as I got there, the first place I went was straight to my son Brandon's room. Now, nine times out of 10 on a Friday night, he'd be gone out to the movies or whatever with his friends. But I opened this door and there he was lying in bed watching TV propped up. And a big smile came across his face. So I went over and gave him a hug. And we didn't even say a word to one another. We, it was just kind of a homecoming sort of thing. Highly unusual, but a very touching and um, in retrospect, very important. The next day was January 10th, 2004. I had gotten up, made my coffee, and uh, Brandon was in playing his bass, and he was on the computer. And then I went in and joined him with my guitar and me on his bass, and we practiced a few songs. And then shortly thereafter, he made mention of a hike that he and some friends had intended to go on. And I started just feeling uncomfortable with this uh, idea of the hike. And it actually got to the point where I felt, and I don't claim to get have visions or uh, unusual paranormal type events take place, but I felt this kind of overwhelming feeling of like an energy was a feeling of, of impending danger that could even potentially take his life. And uh, just before he left for the hike, the last thing uh, I had said to him was, Brandon, please don't go on the hike. And he said, uh, we're going, Dad. A couple of friends had invited me to go hiking for the first time, had hiked, and um, we first got on the trail, and my friend's name is Mike. He said, hey, you know, why don't we go up a different route instead of taking the Mark's trail? And uh, we also noticed that the teenagers off in the distance were ahead of us, so we immediately were like, we got to beat them to the top. So we kind of had this little competition thing we were thinking in our head. But along the way, um, we just periodically saw uh, the teenagers, and it was Brandon and his friends, and we were almost to the peak, and we noticed uh, <clears throat> we could hear real faint the off like a no like real faint. We looked over and I saw um, on a, a maybe a peak or two over. I'm up. I'm turning this way. He was like over there, and I saw him waving. Like I don't know if they were saying hello, whatever you know, hi. We were kind of, and then the more. I paid attention the more it was it was uh, you could tell it was they were in distress it was a help and y'all decided hey you know something's really wrong we should go help i saw mike and he was he had already gone over and i noticed um there's somebody laying on the ground and he was waving and said i could hear him say he's not breathing my phone rang and i said oh good because uh, I left a note on the counter asking Brandon to call us when he returned home. But the call wasn't coming from the house. It was coming from my other son, Stephen, who was at work. And his message really shook me to the core. He said that the other boys who were hiking with Brandon were trying to call us at the house, but we weren't answering, so they called him. Stephen, I mean. And that uh, Brandon apparently hadn't been feeling well and had been passing out on the mountain, and they needed help. When I looked down and, and um, it was Brandon and his, his lips were purple. Uh, he was barely really pale. Uh, his shirt was up a little and I noticed his stomach and he just.
Hi, everyone. I don't know what's happening. And I think that Mark has actually left. So we're going to have to, uh, I've been trying to text him. Uh, this is very strange. I don't know where he went. I see that his screen is empty. So let me go ahead and um, try to view. Here we go. I'm going to, oh, here's Mark. Uh, Mark, your video uh, went silent. Uh, we can still see the images, for, but for about three minutes now, we haven't been okay. able. Okay. There it is. It's back. I don't know why it muted itself. Okay. Um, still no sound. It's quiet during this part. Oh, okay. Good. Uh, Kate is asking if we could go back. Can you by any chance just go back? Because I think people are wanting to know what happened there. To go through uh, is beyond words that I can use to describe the pain that we felt and the sense of despair. It was okay, we went everything we could to help. The first person we were introduced to was a chaplain and that didn't seem like good news to me. And it was probably within 20 minutes of that that we were informed that Brandon had passed, which was a devastating thing for us and for any parent to go through. Uh, it's beyond words that I can use to describe the pain that we felt and the sense of despair at that moment. I just couldn't believe it. I'm sitting there looking at a you know, 17, 18 year old kid dead. You know, what, what can you say? I had a lot of questions as do many people about concepts of life, death, and life after death, and conducted some of my own personal investigations through some of the top mediums around the world. I was uniquely qualified because my father was a famous psychic medium, Dr. Richard Ireland. I've been in this business for a long time, and I've worked with a lot of people who do mentalist acts, and I don't think it's a telling secret out of school to say that most of them are demonstrations for entertainment. Uh, but in this case, uh, what this man does just puzzles me completely and, of course, fascinates all of us. Here is Dr. Richard Ireland. At this moment, uh, as you can see, we have our uh, ushers in the aisle uh, collecting the notes from the members of our audience. We thought it was important that you at home see that uh, so that you don't assume there's been any trickery in the handling of the cards. They are being picked up at this minute taken directly from the people who have just filled them out. Therefore, it follows that Dr. Ireland cannot have seen them, as indeed he has done, could not have done so. And uh, they're being picked up by a member of our staff here, uh, who all of us have in plain sight. And of course, you will recognize when you... Mark, it's muted again for some reason. Oh, it's because it's tied to my vote. If I'm muted, it's muted. I think that that's what happens. Uh, sorry. I'm sorry. About that. That's okay. Here, no we'll worries. just let it go here. I should have tested this more. <laughs> <laughs> You're fine. I had a lot of questions as do many people about concepts of life, death and life after death and conducted some of my own personal investigations through some of the top mediums around the world. I was uniquely qualified because my father was a famous psychic medium, Dr. Richard Ireland. I've been in this business for a long time and I've worked with a lot of people who do mentalist acts and I don't think it's a telling secret out of school to say that most of them are demonstrations or entertainment. Uh, but in this case, uh, what this man does just puzzles me completely and, of course, fascinates 
all of us. Here is Dr. Richard Ireland. At this moment, uh, as you can see, we have our uh, ushers in the aisle uh, collecting the notes from the members of our audience. We thought it was important that you at home see that uh, so that you don't assume there's been any trickery in the handling of the cards. They are being picked up at this minute taken directly from the people who have just filled them out. Therefore, it follows that Dr. Ireland cannot have seen them, as indeed he has not, could not have done so. And uh, they're being picked up by a member of our staff here, uh, who all of us have in plain sight. And of course, you will recognize when you hear your own questions referred to. And as you'll see now, Dr. Ireland has begun the, uh, perhaps you can even get a closer shot here on that uh, activity, the uh, task of uh, covering up uh, all the area around his eyes with uh, surgical tape, which has the, uh, well, whatever the point is worth, the Johnson & Johnson label inside the little roll here. And, uh, Would you like to verify it perhaps? Uh, yes, uh, that sounds really clear. Again, let me, uh, it's going to be a closer shot because I think around the country people think, oh, he's peeking someplace. No, this is all covered and it's right down here tight against the nose, so there's obviously no chance for light to get through there. The All right. And this is a real thick blindfold. We check these two, the three of them, as a matter of fact. It's amazing that even after I've uh, put uh, all this on, that uh, certain skeptics who simply won't uh, be convinced are inclined uh, not to believe even then. Huh. Well, I'm generally skeptical about such things, but you, you sure covered me the other night. That's in case anyone thinks the holes are all lined up. Or that if, in fact, I might be peeking, if the papers could be brought up here now, uh, we'll get involved with those all in right, just a uh, moment. Marty, you, oh, they're, they're already here. The other day I was accused of peeking out of here. <laughs> yes, people actually, well, they'll, they'll make up any theory to avoid thinking that. Oh, really? Uh, a lady told me that she thought I'd had a hole bored between my eyes and my nose that I could see out of my nostril. That's true. Yeah. I want to say hello to Alan now. Alan likes me. was I wanted to talk to my uncle and see if he could pull through any information because he had the same abilities as my father. So when I spoke to him, uh, I, he said, let me know if there's anything I can do for you. And I just said, if you get any message or you have anything that you can pass along about Brian's well-being, 
it would I would really appreciate it. It was about a day later, a day or two later, I was in the mortuary um, making arrangements and my cell phone rang and my uncle was on the other line. And he said, Mark, there's something I wanted to tell you. I said, okay. He said, last night I, I tried to see if I could get anything and I, I didn't get anything at all. But this morning I got up and was doing my meditation as I start every day. And during that, your father came to me and he just, he looked just like he always has. And uh, I hadn't seen him in some time, but he has visited me since he's passed. And he wanted to let me know that he was there to meet Brandon when Brandon passed. And initially Brandon was confused, but your dad helped him adjust and, and to cross over. My uncle said, your dad said that Brandon's death was caused by a lack of oxygen, oxygen that caused his heart to fail. Well, at that point in time, we did not have any results in terms of what had happened to cause Brandon's death. And it was within the week um, later on that I spoke to the autopsy physician and she described the cause of death as a severe asthma attack that restricted his um, breathing, decreasing his blood oxygen levels, causing cardiac arrest. So my uncle was able to accurately confirm that, um, that validation or that information before the autopsy was even conducted. So for me, that was a strong start. Afterward, I began uh, meeting with some other mediums. One of my uh, tests was at the University of Arizona Human Energy Systems Laboratory, which is no longer functioning. But in that particular case, it was a single blind experiment where the medium who was, who was facilitating the process, Lori Campbell, did not know who I was, and I didn't even know who she was going to be until the process started. Today, Dr. Schwartz is testing Laurie's unusual powers using volunteer sitter Mark Island. First question is, what does the, the deceased look like? Child, I can see brown hair, because I keep feeling like I'm looking at outdoor pictures. Capturing a child outdoors. Can he, can he show you what this is a cause of death? How did that God, I feel like the air is just like sucked right out of me with my chest, my whole chest area. The weird thing is I feel like I want to throw up. It's like, um, and I keep seeing a tree planted. So I feel like there's things in his name or his honor. I don't know if it's a plaque on a wall. After the reading, Lori discovers how much of what she's seen is true. Was there, by the way, a tree or something? Yes. This high tree? His school planted a tree as a memorial with a plaque. Wow, school with a tree. Yeah. And a plaque. She even accurately described Brandon's death due to an asthma attack. His friend and him didn't realize it was asthma because the symptoms were different than any other asthma attack he'd ever had. And um, he did throw up just before passing away. I'd say Lori's accuracy was in the 70 to 80% range. It may end up being higher after I go back through some of that and take time to look at the names and things. Near-death experience phenomena is another area of consciousness survival being explored. Dr. Pinman Lum, Dr. Bruce Grayson, and Dr. Sabong are three researchers in this field. What has been uncovered in this sort of phenomena is the idea that people go through a death process, and then when they're revived, they report some unusual circumstances, such as going through a tunnel of white light, being able to hover over their physical body, looking down at the environment, and meeting deceased loved ones with the choice to depart from the physical world or return to it. Skeptics have argued that the brain must still be functioning during this period of time, creating a hallucination or artificial experience. There are a few cases that challenge skeptics. One involved a woman named Pam Reynolds, who had a severe brain aneurysm. The only way the doctors could operate on her was to reduce her body temperature down to 60 degrees Fahrenheit and remove all the blood from her brain and body. They did this for about a 45 minute period where there was no heartbeat and no brainstem activity of any kind. After Pam was revived, she reported hovering over her body and described in detail the instruments that she saw the doctors using on her. She was exactly correct. In addition, she reported meeting deceased loved ones and experiencing a feeling of warmth before going back into her body. One of the primary problems with mainstream science in terms of looking at this sort of evidence is they want to see a theory that's testable. Um, so they're ignoring the evidence because they feel there's no theory out there that they can test against. But I would contend that the universe is a mysterious place and to just disregard evidence that leads to a conclusion or a possible conclusion is a mistake.
name is Michelle Markey. I am a student at NAU up in Flagstaff and going to see a medium today apparently. Um, his name is Jamie Clark. I have never met him before. I actually just found out his name today. So, um, and I'm kind of excited to see what he has to say. So, I, I'm not quite sure exactly what you might touch on, but my um, dad passed away almost four years ago. And then my great grandmother passed away about a year after that. And so I'm thinking if there's anything that I'm expecting him to talk about, it would be um, my dad or my great grandma. Not crossing my fingers that anything um, will um, be correct or, you know, he'll even be able to talk to me about anything. When your people come through, I have no control over who comes through or your permission, but I'll always stay true to it. Okay. There is somebody who comes through that to me is three years or sooner has passed. Okay, so I hope you know nobody like that, but I'm going to ask you, I'm telling you, that's how clear they are. There's also what I feel like is a male father figure. So I hope your dad's still alive. And if he is, to me, father-in-law, stepdad, grandpa puts himself on a father level. Otherwise, mom or dad lost a brother. Okay, but there's a father energy. And as this person comes through, uh, I can't breathe. I get a real heaviness in my chest. To me, last stages of cancer, um, uh, congestive heart failure, pneumonia, uh, and I'm done. Okay, but I need to say thank you for helping me. He makes me feel like you're never appreciated that way. He loves you. He makes you feel like I'm sorry. Okay, whatever that is. <laughs> Never so sorry, David. Can't let You've been wanting to hear. You talk all the time. You listen. Remember, communication is sending and receiving. Keep the one keep you. Okay. And then I'm gonna have to come in. Dad figure he's coming through. Yeah. And again, either it's really good guesswork or just yeah. maybe there's something to it. I gotta say, even as much as he tried. I, I feel like he tried. I just feel like. Stubborn? Oh, <laughs> 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 Don't piss him off. <laughs> Good guy, but he'll stand up. No problem. Yeah. I'll tell you like it is. Besides that, grandma. You got a grandmother figure who comes through. Um, very strong, very <laughs> loving, very compassionate. Yeah. She comes through like the icon of the family. I feel like people will go to her. Not that she knew everything, because she did, but she could speak from her own life experience. And she goes, you know, here's what I did, and here's how it turned out. I hope that helps. She comes through very gracious, but very powerful. Okay? So she'll <laughs> tell you the life it is, man. Oh, Ooh, yeah. You know, Wonder where the other one got it yeah. from, right? <laughs> that makes sense. Now, don't fall too far from the tree. But I will also say that there seems to be a reconnection for your dad and his family. Okay? And I'm sure that they had phenomenal relationships, but I will say on the heels of that, right, he now has the understanding that there's respect, appreciation, and validation. You need to say thank you for what you said. Okay? To me, if you don't light candles, someone's known for lighting candles. Okay? So whoever that is, thanks for lighting candles. <laughs> but if you don't, you'll see. That's hilarious. Oh, my dance. God. <laughs> Mediumship is mental telepathy. That's it. Just sending and receiving information. I'm just slow, so I had to do it long enough to find out. Okay, so that's what I'm doing. Because I'll be, you know, fine line between the insane asylum, honey, and, <laughs> and doing this stuff. So it's that balance that, because I was always hearing things and I was always seeing things. You know, you start to think, you're nuts, man. But thankfully, like your family, my whole family was intuitive themselves. So I always had my mom to work with me. So for you know, 20 years, we studied all the different religions and thousands of books. And I wanted to understand where other people were coming from. So I had more of an effective well-roundness to have compassion. How can I communicate if I can't even understand where the person's coming from? When they're on the other side, they 
you can reorganize that meaning for us in the average human awareness. It is communication verbally. When you're doing it in mediumship, it's mental telepathy. So they will shift from verbal words to feelings that shift into my English. I need all the help I can get. So I work with all, all the modalities. We're like tuners. You know, if you're tuning into one channel, that's beautiful. But you're kind of limited. You only have one channel. Mm -hmm. Nobody's the same physically. They're certainly not going to be the same metaphysically. So I need a variety of channels to be able to connect. Some like classic, some like jazz, some rock and roll. So when I do readings, you know, you're going to say, I, I feel this. Well, dad's making me feel that. Like, that's, I don't know, but that's the language. So again, it goes around any roadblocks. It's that type of unlimited oneness. Okay, so those emotions, that soul connection, bypasses all the different languages and all the lack of comprehension and understanding and beautifies you. That was a really um, amazing thing. It was kind of really interesting to see or to hear him say things that totally made sense. When he was talking about my dad and my great grandma, like, he nailed them to a T, their personalities, like everything about them. I'm not saying everything he said was 100% correct, but, you know, the things that he did get right make me feel like the rest of it is likely to happen as well. Empty space was once thought to be void of all energy, but actually it's been discovered that it's teeming with energy. And the space within spaces contains this energy as well. So if all in the physical world is made up of underlying energy, what's to say there aren't other dimensional realities paralleling ours, perhaps, that are more subtle or invisible to our perception that exist just as well? And that could be perhaps the home of our spiritual self, the other part of us that does survive the death process. Everything in the physical world is made up of atoms. Atoms are made up of subatomic particles. According to string theory, which marries quantum mechanics Newtonian physics. Everything underlying the subatomic particles are strings of vibrating energy. So, and in accordance with Einstein's E equals MC squared equation, energy and matter are essentially interchangeable. So what that means is underlying everything that we see, it's essentially energy in vibration. So how it manifests to our eye or our senses is just a matter of perhaps the shape of the string and the level or the rate of vibration. So after going through this personal exploration, it's given me even more confidence that there is something after this physical life and that we do go on. But it's also added a deeper meaning to the life while we're here and the importance of living today to the fullest. And it's taken me from worrying so much about tomorrow and spending all my energy on worrying about a day that may or may not be here. And focusing more on today in the moment at hand because ultimately that's what we have and we're not guaranteed anything more than that and i would just say that i'm a, i'm a happier person and i'm a more contented person than i used to be okay can you hear me elizabeth looks frozen there for a minute now i guess we're back so hopefully people will really see and hear the video okay i know we had a couple technical problems that were my fault but uh hopefully we got through it all right um, I'm going to, since we only have 15 minutes, I'll go ahead and open it up to questions now and anything that interests anyone, we can go ahead and dive into those topics. I'm happy to answer just about anything you ask. So fire away in the chat room. Well, let's go ahead and see what we have so far. It's interesting because, um, Gordine is saying I watched Steve Allen regularly and I remember this vaguely. So. Um, that's pretty amazing. I, I just want to mention to everyone on here that what Mark described in this video presentation um, is contained in a book called Soul Shift, Finding Where the Dead Go. And I'm going to put that, or maybe Irene, if you could type that into the side uh, box, that would be wonderful. That was one of the first books that I ever um, read uh, on this journey. And um, I, I think I highly recommend it. Kate is asking, we hear that anyone can develop the ability to connect with the other side. And yet some people seem especially gifted or skilled. Can you please speak to this? Sure. Yeah, this is one of the common questions I get asked all the time. And I think everyone does have some level of ability that if you work on it, you can get some level of achievement. But I do find that there are certain individuals who have more natural aptitude. They're just born with it. Um, my dad had that. 
I've met people who are gifted mediums that have that. It's an inborn thing. And I just think it's, if you compare it to like a sports analogy, you could have, um, anyone could play basketball, but not everyone could be Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant or someone of that stature level, LeBron James. Uh, and if you have the combination of someone who has that natural aptitude, plus they work hard at developing it, then you're going to get, you know, the very top tier type of uh, medium. But the, the average person can have some sort of um, abilities themselves, definitely. Um, like I, I mentioned before that I've not really worked on this very hard myself, but I, for a back, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, I did some test readings with friends just to see what I could do and surprise myself. I got some interesting and specific information, but I think the one that really blew me away the most was just a few years ago, I went to speak at a spiritualist church in San Francisco with a medium friend, Tina Powers. And before going there, she kept hounding me that I was going to get a message and she wanted me to share it and asked if I would. And I said that I would. And every time she kept asking me again, I said, yes, I'll share it. And finally, the day came, we went to the church. I sat down for a half hour beforehand and kind of meditated. And two names popped into my head. Uh, one was Max and the other was Maxine. I didn't know what that meant, if anything. It could have been, as far as I knew, my imagination. Um, this church had been founded in 1924 by a woman named Florence Becker, who I guess was a lot like my father, in fact. And um, she passed in 70 or 1971 or somewhere in that time frame. Anyhow, I go up and give my talk. And at the very end, I told the congregation, I said, well, I promised Tina that I'd share any information that I got. Um, so here goes. I got two names. I don't know if they mean anything to anyone, but the names are Max or Maxine. And the pastor of the church, his jaw dropped, and he said, those were the names of two children born to Florence Becker, who was the church founder. And I think we know who's here. So, I mean, what a crazy thing. And these are very subtle little things that popped into my mind, but I had the courage to share them and they turned out to be right. And not only right, but pretty specific and obscure kinds of things. So you never know, I think, um, Everybody has some level of aptitude, too, but I think some people just are naturally going to be better at, at certain things than others. That's amazing, though, and I think that it was also amazing to watch your father work with that billet reading. That was, that was something that I've never seen before. But Brenda has a really good question, and this is something that I, I think is kind of what everyone would like to know. She has two scheduled readings coming up and there's there are mediums that she found on the HPH website that are recommended by parents. Um, I am so in need of some messages from my son who passed three years ago this Friday, February 5th. Is there a way that I can prepare myself for these readings? Could you maybe tell her some tips about sure. how to go into those readings? Sure, the first thing I, do and recommend people doing is, you know, prior to the reading, send out kind of prayerful thought messages to your loved ones, let them know when you're going to be there and, you know, who you're seeing mentally and ask for them to be there. That's really, you know, what I've done and had success with and other people have done too. Um, you know, the other thing, the other variable is how, you know, the, the quality of the medium that you're getting and how on they are that day. So even the very best people have some days are better than others, but that's the best thing you can do. And then when you have the reading to try and get yourself in a really upbeat, high energy, if you can, to go into that, um, and it tends to help the medium function better. Naturally, you don't want to volunteer information or start telling them too much and try and keep your answers more succinct. Uh, if they give you a piece of information, don't spill your guts and tell them everything. Otherwise, you're not going to really get the full benefit of the reading. So I'd say the, the preparation in advance, um, the, um, the mental disposition going into it, being positive and as upbeat as you can be, maybe even do your own little meditation before you start. And then, um, you know, don't volunteer too much information. It's fine to say, yeah, that's right. Or yes, my child liked that. Or, you know, based on those comments, but just don't don't tell them too many details. Let them tell you. That's beautiful. I also want to just add something that I heard from Suzanne Wilson in the very beginning, and that is that 
when you're going to have a reading, for instance, the next day, write a list of questions that you'd love for your child to uh, answer and write them by hand and just meditate on them think about them uh, at night don't be don't be sad if all of the questions aren't answered but if those are questions that you would really like for them to answer a lot of times uh, that will help happen during the reading um, I think this is a great question. Mark, was your wife equally seeking as you were when your son transitioned? I'd say we were really on the same page there. Um, she didn't have as much of the background as I did. She came from a more traditional, you know, religious background in the Lutheran um, faith, but she was always open to this. And obviously she saw my dad uh, when we first started dating and <laughs> It was ironic because he the day I took her it was our second date and she didn't um, she'd never seen anything like this before and I said well you want to go see my dad's demonstration she goes sure and we get in there and he's already started he's blindfolded so I tell her to write a question and she writes a question down which was um, will my mom be getting married and she asked that because her mom had been divorced from her dad and had been dating the same person for a long time and it kind of been non-committal so she sends this question up and uh, within a reasonable period of time, my dad gets the paper and he's like, Susie Sap, Su Sap, and it, Susie Sipe was her name at the time, last name Sipe. And he says, uh, well, I, Susie, I think you've asked about your mother and if she'll be getting married. Well, I don't know about your mother, my dear, but you've made your choice of men and he's with you tonight. <laughs> and then I had to speak up and say, uh, dad, this is Mark, uh, Susie's my date. And then he says, oh, I guess I just married off my own son. Oh, how beautiful. What a fun way to learn that you're getting married. I just wanted, one of the reasons I asked that question is that I've known Susie from the beginning of this journey. She's absolutely wonderful. But one of the first things that she told me when we met was that our kids are home and we're still in school. And I think that that's one of the most beautiful things that I've heard on this journey and I truly believe it, that they are home and we're still in school. So I'm glad that she was with you on this journey. She was definitely with me on this journey as well. Um, I, I have a question um, from Babette and it's a good question. Do you easily communicate with Brandon and do you still feel the desire to meet with a medium? Um, well, first off, I. I'd say that I communicate with Brandon, not all the time, but I, I say a prayer for him every day and every night. I also um, think about him and sometimes I feel like he overshadows me, if that's the right term. I can kind of feel his, his energy. And sometimes I feel he inspires things in my writing. We actually just had a very interesting thing happen over the holidays that Elizabeth's going to put into the newsletter, I guess the next one out, um, where we have a a Christmas tree that's pre-lit and it's and we've had it for a number of years and it's worked great and um, it started we turn it off at night and it would come on in the middle of the night and this happened for a number of nights consecutively and there are three settings bright white color lights or or going back and forth between the two in alternating fashion so it was like weird and it, this was coming up on Brandon's anniversary of his passing date and so the, the very last night um, we had talked about, should we leave it up longer? Cause this might keep happening and we were gonna take it down the next day. So um, we had that discussion. And then later that evening, the, the, the tree was off and it had come on by itself again, but this time it was in full color lights. So we kind of took that as a sign that it was okay to turn it off. But I've had a lot of signs over the years but also other kinds of direct uh, communications. I still like um, to get a medium reading now and then. I'm not hooked on them or have to have them, but it's it's always nice to get something independently of yourself because sometimes you question yourself too. Like, oh, this was this really him or was it really that? I think the less we could do that, the better. We don't, you know, I think it's good to have healthy skepticism, but at the same time, you have to acknowledge these things to some degree to really process them and enjoy them and, and realize they're trying hard to connect with us, just like we want to connect with them. So um, an occasional reading, yeah, I don't get them all the time, but I know so doggone many mediums now that they volunteer this stuff to me anyhow. 
Which is definitely a gift, obviously. Um, Suzanne is asking, which one of the Claire's do you think is the most prevalent? She's guessing Claire sentience, but could you maybe speak to that? Um, I, I think so. I would, you know, Claire sentience would be feeling, you know, we're sensing. Um, you, I mean, some people might include things like smelling a cologne that maybe someone you love used to wear or smelling pipe tobacco or whatever. Um, but I, I think, you know, clairvoyance is clear vision. So that's, I'll get that sometimes. I'll get like a visual in my mind. Um, and then uh, clear audience is clear hearing. Uh, but I don't always think that's like an auditory hearing. It's more like how those names dropped into my mind. That would be more clear audience. So if you have multiple of these, like Jamie Clark was talking about, you're gonna be better at the mediumship thing because you have various ways to get the information. Clairsentience, I would guess, is the most common because it's more the the feeling part. And I get that too sometimes where you just feel, you just know something. There's an inner knowing and a, and a sense of feeling. So I, I would agree with you there, I think. That's beautiful. Well, um, and I'm glad that you went through the different Claire's so that people know about them. Iris is asking a really good question and maybe this will have to be the last because we're coming up on the hour, but um has your father ever come through in a reading oh all the time i mean since the very beginning even going back to that discovery channel feature you, you saw the clip of there was so much more than that uh, my dad was popping through with all kinds of things then and one of the first times was in my reading with allison dubois which was back in 2004. two weeks before that reading uh, someone had given me a manuscript that was in a box it was all eight and a half by 11 pages and it was called Your Psychic Potential, A Guide to Psychic Development by Dr. Richard Ireland. And I'm like, well, where did you get this? He goes, well, you were out of state at the time and your dad gave this to me for safekeeping before he passed. I said, well, why are you giving this to me now? He goes, I don't know why. I just feel like I'm supposed to. Two weeks later, I have the reading with Alison Dubois and she says, well, your father's here and he's showing me a book, but I feel it's his book and he's handing it to you. Does this make sense? Um, and then I've subsequently been able to get that book published um, and it's on my website too, but that was one of the early ones, uh, but he's come through many, many times. And actually I get stuff all the time from the, the cadre of <laughs> mediums that are friends that I know. So, and then oh. a lot of them are big fans of his really. Yes, actually, I know that Kat talks about your dad coming through and your uncle coming through <clears throat> all the time to help her in her readings as well, which is really interesting. I don't think she ever obviously knew him uh, in real life, but she certainly works with them now, which is very fun. Um, but I, I really think that it's important for um, everyone to understand that what you are doing with Brandon is also available to them. Also, yeah. I have one question here and, and maybe we could just address it very quickly um, sure. where one of the parents got very generic information in the reading. I don't know if this was someone that was a helping parents heal medium. I don't believe so. It doesn't look like that. But um, I, I think that it is important um, to kind of understand what kind of information, maybe you could just um, conclude with this, what kind of things should be a part of a reading that actually is helpful, healing, and uplifting, and what things maybe shouldn't be a part? Could you just, I know that's a big question, but maybe yeah. let people know. I think the first step is you really need to find somebody who's a good medium. Whoops. You are frozen. You know, not easy to find and put on a list. So, yep. so yeah, that's why the certification process exists and why there's a list to, um, to provide you lists of names. And, you know, I will say some test better than others. And, um, but if you can get with somebody that's at least been vetted or that you know is good from a, a really good uh, reference, that's a good starting point. But when, when a medium just starts throwing out generalities, it's not very satisfying to me. You should be getting information that's specific to your child or your loved one who's said to be coming through. That could include like what they did for a living, whether they were in school, did they get a degree? What was their favorite food? 
hopefully what's their name. It seems like a lot of the mediums today aren't as good with names. You know, my dad was great with names and I was used to that. Um, some mediums can give names. Lori Campbell in the Discovery Channel thing, she did provide some names. So um, I think it's the specific stuff. And if there's something that's important to you too, and it comes through, it can be really meaningful. But if someone's just like, I feel you were very close. Um, oh, I've got a grandmother here um, and she was, she liked to cook, you know, things like that just aren't that meaningful to me. Now you could have a mix of things that are, that are good. Um, and that's great. Uh, that are just, you know, more general, as long as they're accompanied by the other stuff. So it's like, if you get five, six, 10 specific things that, you know, fit and are meaningful to you. And then accompanied by that is, Hey, your child loves you very much. They miss you or they're, you know, they're around you all the time. Well, then I can accept that because you're right on the stuff that I can validate. That's wonderful. We have a question here that I think you, you probably cannot answer. And that is, who is your favorite or most highly recommended certified medium on HPH? I think that's <laughs> probably impossible to be able to say that. But I, I can say, and I think that Mark can also say that um, the people who are on the list are absolutely incredible. I wanted to just go back and let pe let you know, people are saying, thank you, awesome, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Your humility is really heartwarming. Um, Meryl is saying, I rarely get to see these sessions live. I'm, I've been blessed today, thank you. Rhonda wow. saying, thank you. Cheryl saying, thank you. Mark, Elizabeth and Irene, um, as well as, let's see. Thank you, Mark. This is very beautiful to hear. Thank you, Mark, and always Elizabeth and Irene. And um, I, I, we always love to hear about the wonderful readings that people have had with the providers because we love to put them in the newsletter and to let other people know about those experiences. But it's important also to know that every time I get a recommendation for any of the mediums, I put them up on the website. So some of these mediums have almost 20 recommendations. Some of them have less. And it doesn't mean that the other ones are not quite as good. They might not be as good at asking to have a recommendation put up. They're also maybe a little newer onto the site. But um, one of the things that you can be assured of is that we do have a lot of these mediums coming and doing demonstrations for us. So you can also kind of get an idea of what they do, but your father, Mark, is just amazing. I've never seen anything like that in my life, and that was really fun to watch. The, so, it, I'll it, go I'll ahead. Just take an extra minute here to tell so, uh, just a couple stories about my dad, just because there's these things that people come to me with years later that are just mind boggling. So, one of my favorites has to do with a woman named Norma Poling. I was going to do a talk at the Logo Center years ago. And the room was filled to, to capacity. It probably only held 100, 120 people, but it was full. She came by and said, Mark, I have a story to tell you. And she actually gave me a typewritten version of it and then told me. She says, you know, I saw your father first in 1963, and he'd asked us all to write a message. So I was trying to decide what to ask. And I was either going to ask, will I get my master's degree or will I have a fourth child? So I only wrote the one about the master's degree, sent it up. And your dad was almost done. I didn't think I was going to get it answered, but he did answer me. And he says, oh, you, yes, you're going to get your master's degree. And lo and behold, she did. So then five years passed after that. And then she saw him again after five years. And this time she wrote an entirely new question. She sends up the new question. And my dad gets the paper and he says, oh, Norma, Norma Poling, I see you had that fourth child. Now that's something oh, she never wrote. Goodness. She only thought of five years earlier. Kind of blows your mind in terms of time and space and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> that's amazing. It's really beautiful. Well, I am so appreciative that you came on to speak to us this evening. And I have a feeling that you might need to come back again to answer even more questions. So this sure. was great for tonight. Yes, thank but, you, Mark. Um, will probably want you to come back again uh, sometime soon. And thank you all for being on here. Please don't forget that tomorrow we have Bill Van Oyge, who is amazing. He's like 
um, the antithesis of anyone who would have ever thought that he would be able to do what he's doing. He's astral traveling. He is um, automatic writing. He's doing all of these things through his son, Greg, and didn't believe in any of this before. But he's our Calgary affiliate leader with his wife, Susan. So I hope that you'll be on there for that. Um, if you're not, then you might be in the father's meeting. And then again, Pauline on Thursday. And um, she's always so much fun to have speak to us. So thank you all for being here. Did yes, you unmute, unmute everybody? yourselves? Yes, please unmute yourselves and say, say thank, thank you and you goodbye and to Mark. Goodbye to Mark. You're welcome. Thank, thank, thank you, Mark. Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Soon. Yes. Elizabeth, thank you, Mark. <laughs> Thank You're you. Bye, Bye, everybody.